Latinx, a person of Latin American origin or descent used as a gender neutral or non-binary alternative to Latino or Latina. Latinx, we're black, we're brown, we're white. We're immigrants, we break binaries and cross borders. We speak all languages and are of all abilities, faiths, spiritualities, sizes, gender identities, sexual orientations, and documentation statuses. And we're here to stay. I'm Alejandra. I'm Ana. This is Latinx Mental Health Podcast, where we talk to therapists, researchers, artists, activists, and students about their experiences in the intersections of mental health and Latinx identity. In each interview, we aim to connect through our voices, our struggles, and our triumphs as we sample a different herbal tea, just like Abuela used to make. For this episode, we spoke to Eva Escobedo, a licensed professional counselor who works in private practice and as a supervisor at the YWCA Greater Austin. We drank cardamom tea and talked about the trauma of migration and how therapists can help people heal. The Latinx Mental Health Podcast is not a substitute for professional mental health care. We encourage you to seek resources and support in your community. Hello, Eva. Hello. How are you? Good. We're doing good. And uh, we're just going to start with the questions. Sounds good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a therapist? Sure. So my journey started um, over 30 years ago. Uh, I studied psychology at Columbia University, and then I got a master's in REBT, so Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. Um, not at all what I practice from anymore. And I started working at a mental health clinic in New York City uh, for the chronically mentally ill, for the Spanish-speaking chronically mentally ill. And so that has been my journey. Um, Can you talk a little bit about what brought you to the United States? Sure. So we came, after practicing for many years in Mexico City, we came back to live in Austin um, 10 years ago because Mexico became a dangerous place. And so wanting to have more security um, for our family, we decided to move here. And that was sort of a hard journey because I had to go back to school here in order to be able to practice as a therapist. Do you want to, I guess, tell us a little bit about your journey in Austin? So where you went to school and where you are now? Sure. So the first two years, I was a pre-K teacher in Maynard. Um, Almost died in the process. It was very, (laughs) very hard. Um, Doing that, it was a cultural shock. So once we decided that we would stay here, I started the professional counseling program at Texas State. I worked, uh, while I was studying, I was a BIP facilitator, so a battery intervention program facilitator. And then I was hired at the YWCA as lead counselor while I was also accruing um, my hours in order to do private practice under um, SOL. Community counseling, which provided a sliding scale um, services for the community. And then I became a clinical supervisor at the Y almost four years ago. And I'm also part of a group practice called Just Mind. So I think today we really wanted to focus on trauma. So can we just start by having you define trauma? So trauma doesn't necessarily have to mean something that is devastated or devastating or that is life altering, but it can be. So for example, um, immigration. Immigration always involves trauma because there's a loss of security, there's a loss of the known. Um, But depending on other circumstances, if it was a voluntary immigration, uh, if uh, there was some comfort in in the arrival, so if there's some buffering factors, it can be an experience that ends up being one that creates strength and resilience. However, that same event for somebody who does not have those buffers. And on the contrary, where that experience is aggravated by other factors. So for example, not speaking the language, not having, and, and therefore not not being able to access basic services because that's mm. that's our human nature, right? We use language in order to be able to have access to 
the things that we need. Um, so when we don't have that, when we have those limitations, when there is fear because of our status or because of any other factor, um, financial, social, etc., that can then become uh, internalized and then we would have a post-traumatic stress disorder, mm-hmm. right? And so that's what we would, that's, that's what we think of when we think of trauma, right? Okay, so, so, so an experience that is so devastating and so overwhelming to the system that the system cannot recuperate um, adequately and is now in a constant state of either shutdown or hypervigilance. And I, and I like the way that you sort of separate a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very specific diagnosis, yes. and, and other traumas. They're not. I think maybe some people have the misconception that it's the same thing. Yeah. So I was wondering if you would maybe talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and what that looks like clinically. Sure. Um, so I would just like to first um, clarify that I sort of disagree with um, the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder because it does not recognize um, chronic trauma or develop what we call developmental trauma, which is not one overwhelming experience, but a con- continuous experiences that do not allow the system to ever go back to a resting point. And so my definition of post-traumatic stress disorder and that of many other therapists and authors, how would you say, um, autoridades? Experts. Experts, Experts. thank you. There we go. And and as many experts, for example, van der Kolk, um, et cetera, define trauma, including these developmental experiences, as well as other things that are not normally recognized, like immigration. Immigration is generally not recognized as a traumatic event, but it is. So really, um, our defi- our, the DSM, our official definition of trauma, is around accidents and overwhelming physical events. And it really was born out of um, soldiers coming back from combat. And that was the first time that, that the disorder was recognized as such. But it really has not been extended to the experiences of children of women, of immigrants, and generally of disenfranchised people, which is where it happens the the most and where it has its most devastating effects. So that is really shaping the way we we are thinking about trauma and how to respond to it. Yeah, I think that piece is really important because a lot of what we know to be important for people goes much much farther beyond what the DSM tells us. Absolutely. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that in. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess since we're talking about what developmental trauma is and how that might be different than PTSD um, in that more narrow definition, can we talk a little bit about what responses to developmental trauma might look like? Uh, so generally you will see some shutdown. Or you will see hypervigilance just like you would as the way that PTSD is developed, but it might be much subtler. So part of the journey in in working with people who have developmental trauma is helping them really connect with their feelings of fear and their feelings of safety. So recognizing both in the body so they can have a better sense that they can trust themselves in their interaction with others, because that's the piece that was always destroyed when there's developmental trauma. Um, So given that you have worked with the Latinx community in several different places, um, could you tell us a little bit about anything you've noticed about uh, trauma specifically in that community with the understanding that the Latinx community is diverse and broad and includes a lot of different people? After you say that the Latinx community is so broad. One of the first things that comes to mind is what I have noticed, at least in myself, as, as, as part of the struggle and the difficulty, and maybe even some trauma there. One of the hardest things is coming into this country and being put into a straitjacket mm-hmm. and having some of that identity ripped away from us. Okay, so if you are Latin, then you 
then, then you cannot be also white or then you cannot also be this other thing. So there's always a pruning of parts of ourselves. Um, so that's that's the the first thing that that comes to my mind from from the perspective that you gave, right? That includes all of us. I mean, as I said, I think that we do not realize just how traumatic immigration is in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And the loss under the best of circumstances, it requires an adjustment and and that is stressful. And we are hyper vigilant because we don't know, where to buy the milk. We don't know where the doctor is. We don't know how the system works. We don't... Ooh. There are all these unknowns just in navigating basic life. And that is, as I said, under the best of circumstances, when we speak the language, when we have money, when we have resources. And so just make that exponential for people who have left in fear, whose journey here has been paved with pain and terror and all sorts of violations and struggles and losses. And arriving here into pretty hostile, a pretty hostile environment. So there are so many layers of trauma to be worked with, with, with the Latinx community. So could you maybe talk about a typical client? I know you probably see all sorts of different people. May I take people at both ends of the spectrum? Yes. That'd be okay? Please do. Okay. So we generally do not identify as trauma people who have come into the United States with legal status, with resources. So people who have come to study a master's degree or a something degree, and it looks like it's a choice. And so we normally don't recognize that journey as traumatic, however it is. So I think that that's a really important call uh, to remind therapists that it is difficult because the way that we operate is, is, is the, the social rules are very different. So for example, I remember I'll use myself because I fit into that category and how I know that I had severe symptoms of PTSD that were not recognized and that were not addressed because I was considered privileged. Um, and so things as simple as I was used to greeting people with a kiss and a hug because that's what we do. And people would like either like push me to the side. Mm -hmm. um, what they call the side hug. I didn't even know that that was a thing. <laughs> and for a while I was like, what's wrong with me? Do I smell bad? Yeah. Or it's like, what is this? <laughs> I didn't brush my teeth or I, I don't know. And, and, and then I realized that it wasn't me, but it felt like that. And I felt really rejected and, uh, and it was painful. Um, I remember just, just adjusting to things as being invited to a birthday party and for it having an end hour. So you're invited from 12 to 2. That doesn't exist in Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so all of these things felt uh, sharp and, and painful. So, so that's on that spectrum where I think that we need to recognize that it is still a huge adjustment and it is a painful adjustment when everything is going right. So in private practice, I see clients like myself who have immigrated from Latin America, but also from other places, who face very similar challenges, but who hold some privilege. And then at the YWCA, I see the other end of the spectrum. So clients whose journey has been fraught with major horrible events, who have been raped on their journey, who have witnessed the murder of family members, who feel physically unsafe throughout, who arrive here and are severely mistreated or incarcerated um, or detained, who are separated from their family members, who are cut off from any access to contact, who don't have a cell phone, they don't have a regular phone, they don't have a phone card. And so that is what comes to us most often 
and what we encounter most often in, in, in the population that seeks out help. And so I, I do want to compare. So I was able to bounce back because there weren't so many difficulties in my journey. I had so many buffers and advantages. So eventually that PTSD was able to resolve in resilience. But for many of our clients who don't have those pieces, that PTSD may never resolve into resilience, but rather will accompany them as grief manifestations or as physical symptoms, as a chronic mistrust, as a shutdown, as depression, as chronic anxiety. When, and it's and it's not like like so many of these people don't have a chance to really heal. It just it keeps it coming. It just keeps on coming, exactly. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. that's true for a lot of the people I've seen at the Y, too, where it gets layered um, one experience after another where, you know, even once maybe the migration pieces are not quite as present, then a lot of the other conditions in their lives start to become more relevant and the financial piece. And and then there's the expense of migrating, too. I think that becomes um, something that then people have to pay debts or things like that. So just that layering. I think that what you're saying is absolutely right. There is no respite. It's it's like waves. You, you, you're just getting out of the ocean and you get hit again and over and over and over again. So there's never a sense of stability. People really cannot find their footing. It's like, okay, ha, huh, now I can build. Now I can have some solidity. Right. It just doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. So as a, as a clinician, how do you... How do you deal with that under, with that understanding? So one of the most important pieces in, in working with trauma is creating some sense of respite or safety. Sometimes safety is a big word. And, and so, so some of our clients are never going to feel safe because they're not safe, right? So for example, being undocumented, you can never feel fully safe. That doesn't exist. Um, so... I would trade the word safety, which is what we would use normally in working with PTSD, to a respite or to a place of some comfort. And so it can be helping them notice what does it feel like when you have a cup of coffee? What does it feel like when you're sitting here with me? What does it feel like when you smell orange peel? Um... Or something. So just these small moment, momentary um, breaks from the terror. So really enlarging and focusing attention on the things that are okay. Because we can't make the bad ones go away. So that, that, that intentional attention to what's okay or what's not bad creates some sense of balance. It creates a counter vortex to the trauma. I am remembering our conversation at the Y about EMDR and the differences in English and Spanish and mm -hmm. how the word for safety isn't used in Spanish. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk about that because I think that exemplifies sort of the contrast that you're talking about. Yes. So um, in Spanish, we use un lugar de bienestar o un momento de bienestar, so a moment of well-being versus a safe place. Um, because when we work with um, people from the U.S. or people who don't have the experience of immigration, generally thinking about a safe sp space or a safe place is a place of love and a place that they have access to. When we ask an immigrant to do that, they may not have any place that is safe, or if they do, it may be so charged with grief. Because generally, it's not going to be tied to here. It's going to be tied to home. Because that's, that, that's generally where our heart navigates to. That's, that's where well-being happens. So remembering grandma's house or whatever that is, right? Or um, the fields in, in Honduras or, or, or the church where I went, went when we're, whatever those memories are. They're not resources, because the minute that we evoke them comes the grief of not being maybe ever able to access that again. I just got goosebumps because I was remembering somebody that I worked with. Um, yeah. I worked with um, people who were fleeing violence from Mexico right on the border um, over in 
El Paso Ciudad Juarez. And there's this little community called Fabens, which is also right across from some small rural communities in, yeah. in Chihuahua. And I remember people telling me that they could, from their trailer park in the U.S., they could see the church steeples um, yeah. of their home and, and how painful that was. Absolutely. It was not comforting. And no. they, because they could, they could see it, but they couldn't touch it. Right. And, right. and I think right. that's really exemplifies Absolutely. what you're saying. Absolutely. Yes. And so it's what, yes. Can you focus on this cup of coffee that you're having right now? Is that, does that feeling, is that feeling okay, right? Is, is, huh, is the chair comfortable? Mm. So as you look out, is it okay that um, the air conditioner in your car works? So just really being mindful and paying attention to those things that create some sense of well-being. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that's so por important because we don't, we yeah. don't really think about it. I think we use the word safety very easily. Yes. And as social workers and, and perhaps other mental health professionals. Yes. And it's not it's not something that's really accessible for a lot of people. No, no. And I think even outside of this context, it's a word that we really need to think about. I would strongly encourage us to use it much more selectively. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think it also has come to have so many different connotations. I mean, there's um, it's being used in terms of the idea of emotional safety and physical safety. And there's a lot of different ways in which that's not necessarily a word that's accurate enough, which is what I think you're pointing out. Yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily encompass what it means to say, have emotional well-being in yeah. a certain space or in a certain moment or with a certain person or experience. Yeah. And it's not a word that is culturally meaningful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, here we use safe and boundary 30 times a day, especially within the field. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't use in either one of those words in the mental health community in, in, in Latin America at all. Sometimes we talk about limits, maybe a little bit, sort of, not really. Mm -hmm. um, it means it just has a very, very different meaning. And, and again, the, the cultural difference between a very individualistic society, and Latin America being much more communal and, and, and family-based. I would love if you could talk about that a little bit more, um, because it's, it's interesting, as somebody who's kind of like straddled both, yeah. and it's been complicated for me, mm -hmm. so I can't even imagine somebody who's, you know, just trying to navigate it for the first time. Like this I idea of, of boundaries, I found, especially with family, I found that very difficult and kind of jarring and like, what do you, what do you mean? What does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, and also if you could, when you do that, I think the piece that you talk about a lot that I appreciate is the disconnection yes. in the U.S. So I would yeah. love for you to share that a little yes. too. Yes. So um, I think that uh, here we focus so much on the individual and and, and, and yes, so, so autonomy is one of our basic human needs. And I, and I value that and I don't want to take away from that. And I believe that um, our fierce independence comes from, that, from satisfying that need. But it has also come at the cost of connection, which is also one of our basic four human needs needs. And so throughout our lifetime, we're always navigating the need for autonomy and the need for connection. That is the, the very definition of, of developmental stages, right? The baby wants to explore, wants to, to do things on their own, but they still need to be connected. And so how we navigate that and how does that look at two and how does that look in adolescence where it's, again, it's that, that piece, right? I want to belong to this family. I am part of this family, but I want to be independent. Mm -hmm. And how we make it incredibly complicated in the United States and we really push towards autonomy and not pull in towards connection. Um, and so when we work with, with the Latin 
community. We need to keep that in mind, that it is the opposite. It's not about what we want individually. It is about what is best for us as a family, what is best for us as a community, and that benefits us. It's not, oh, you're doing this, you're sacrificing yourself for others. No, in that effort or in that orientation, I am meeting my own needs, my needs for protection, my need for belonging, my need for connection. So, so it's, I think it's incredibly important to remember that. And so it, it, that's why it's not a surprise that here we talk about boundaries, because that's what allows for independence and, and, and this autonomy. And that's why in Latin America we don't talk about boundaries. And that's why, you know, when you're invited to a birthday party, yes, it starts at 12 and <laughs> we have no idea when it will end. And maybe it's going to be two days later because it is about welcoming um, and not about when, when we will separate. Yeah, I feel like it also, the lack of understanding that from peers can also be a challenge because when they don't understand why you might be prioritizing, say, a commitment you made to your family over something else, I think it also creates maybe more distance too um, because it is seen as you're sacrificing something or there's something, you know, you're making this choice. And oftentimes it just doesn't feel like a choice. It's just how you live. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that then that can also create some distancing even further from peers too. Um, That's something that I think can, can make it unsettling too, as you're trying to distinguish between your desire for autonomy and connection to then say, I have to decide this, and I have all my friends also telling me this other piece. And, and, and this is particularly important because I think that we are... Real trauma, generally, is trauma that happens to us in connection to other people. We have this impossible impulse to try to heal in connection because that's, that's how we heal. But when we have been relationally hurt, then it's also our impulse to run away from 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 people so that's that's a lot of the crazy making and that's that's why addictions are so common with trauma because there is no solution when you are my source of comfort and you are my source of terror i'm trapped there's there's nothing there's no resolution to that we'll be back after a short break from this interview Anna, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm from Austin, originally born and raised, and my dad's from the Canary Islands. My mom is from Pennsylvania, and I have one sister who is also our awesome communications coordinator. Mm -hmm. Resident young person. Resident young person. Could you tell us where the Canary Islands are for those listeners who may not know? The Canary Islands are technically part of Spain, um, but there are actually seven islands off the coast of Northwest Africa. And with the last name Hernandez, I feel like people just kind of assume Mexican to mm-hmm. everyone in Texas a lot of the time. Yeah, I think a lot of people just assume everywhere is Mexico. Yes. I had a good friend growing up from Colombia, and I told, like, I had this, like, boyfriend in high school, and I was like, yeah, my friend's from Colombia, and he was like, where is that in Mexico? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but just, see, this is life. Life yeah, in Texas. Yeah. Life in Texas. So, yeah, otherwise, I am a social worker. Um, I also have a master's in Latin American studies. So, Alejandra, what do you want people to know about you? Well, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, um, to a Mexican Jewish family. And I didn't know what being Latina meant because everybody around me was. Like it just seemed like that was just the reality, right? But then uh, in 2008, I moved to Austin to do my undergraduate degree. And that was the first time I realized that I was Latina um, because for for the first time in my life, I was an other. Um, It was a pretty big culture shock. Yeah. I'm currently in my final semester 
fingers Woo-hoo! crossed yeah. of my master's program, which has taken me five years. But um, I like to tell everybody I took the scenic route. Yeah, so I think one thing that's sort of present for both of us, right, mm-hmm. in these stories about our lives is what it's like to move through the world as a white presenting Latinas. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know we've talked about this definitely in the past, and it's something that I'm super mindful of as a social worker, yeah. as an organizer, as an activist. Yeah, and, and it's I think it's good that we put it on the table right now yes. and just be like, we know, we all look super white. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, something that brings us both together, I think, right, is centering intersectionality, centering all kinds of voices, and really bringing us around the topic of mental health. And so our identities as being white presenting is just something that needs to be present and put forward and part of the discussion. Yeah, and part of our own privilege that we're aware of. Our goal is to then utilize what we have in terms of this privilege to be able to have a podcast that really centers all kinds of folks from all kinds of walks of Mm -hmm. life. So Alejandra, Mm -hmm. let's talk about that fateful day where you called me and this whole crazy thing got started. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to try and remember. (laughs) So Anna and I, we have lots of conversations about lots of things. I just remember I was mad about something and was like, why aren't there any Latino people represented in the media? And I'm sick of being a just a maid or a drug dealer or like a gang member. And like I was listening to a podcast about mental health. Mm. And I was like, why don't why aren't our stories being centered? Yeah. And then I think that's when I called you. Yes. And you were like, we should make a podcast. Yeah. And I was like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I didn't say it offhandedly. I think I had like a lot of energy behind it but I also wasn't expecting it to happen like I was just (laughs) expecting to vent um and then and you were like yeah let's do it and then we made a podcast then we made a fucking (laughs) podcast so we would like to introduce our first segment um we'll be doing several of these in between the interviews throughout our episodes and the first one that we're going to start today is called the no mames moment so alejandra can you tell us what no mames means for those of our listeners who don't know yes so it is a very mexican expression which it's it's a little bit difficult to translate but the closest i got was are you kidding me or no way but it's like way ruder than that and in our case i think exasperated yes very exasperated (laughs) this goes out to my girl veronica escobar from el paso who she mouthed no mames Mm -hmm. during the state of the union address when trump was saying that el paso used to be one of the most dangerous cities Um, and so this segment is dedicated to her so in honor of her we would like to talk about the border crisis quote unquote (sighs) so as of right now actually the house voted to stop uh, our president from being able to declare a Mm -hmm. national emergency as the border crisis. So we'll see what happens in the Senate and after that. Um, But it is encouraging to see, I think, a reaction to this. Mm -hmm. Um, As much as I think also a lot of people could be doing more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you saw that there had been an executive order for a national emergency. I know you had feelings. I did have feelings. I had a lot of feelings. <laughs> Where do I even start? Um, rage uh-huh. was one. Uh-huh. Um, exasperation. Mm-hmm. Uh, rage. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> and like kind of this like sinking feeling of hopelessness mm. that I have been trying not to like stay in. But anytime something like this happens, it's just... It's hard. Because you, I mean, you grew up in El Paso, Mm -hmm. which is basically the border. Yeah. Everything that Trump said about El Paso is just not true. Like, El Paso, for a long time, has been one of the safest cities Mm -hmm. in the United States, and it has nothing to do with the wall that was built. In fact, the numbers show that, and this is probably not correlated in any way, but that crime started to rise after the wall was built. Mm. Not significantly. It's still one of the safer cities in the country, but the wall hasn't done anything. And it's just insulting to people from the border because we're proud of what we have. And I think that we do a lot of good things that the rest of the country could learn from, but we just keep getting 
vilified. Well, and I feel like, too, the times that I've been at different parts of the Texas-Mexico border, Mm -hmm. where there isn't such a heavy structure, there is this really lovely way in which the community spans across the border. Exactly. And there's a lot of back and forth, and there's a lot of sharing, and there's a lot of support. And so I feel like cutting literally a wall in the middle of that is just further breaking apart those connections. Exactly. And for me, too, the thing that always comes up in terms of migration is just that people are going to come because Mm -hmm. oftentimes they're coming for their lives. And then the wall usually just forces people to go through deserts and more Mm -hmm. dangerous areas, and then we get more deaths. And so when I think about my reaction of maybe grief or sadness around these Mm -hmm. topics... It also just comes from knowing how much harder it is for people. Yeah. People you know, are going to die. They're going to die. And, and not to mention the ecological... Um, the butterflies. Yeah, the butterflies. The butterflies. And, yeah. So I think, I think for me, for sure, you know, I do a lot of work mm-hmm. in immigrant detention. And so I hear from the people that are applying for asylum, and it's just their concerns are so valid And so to watch over the last couple of years, especially, not that it Mm -hmm. was great before, but just more and more roadblocks coming up. Yeah, it's gotten worse for sure. And then, you know, like you were saying, this is the work that we're in. And so it is a sense of, ugh, ugh, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to say that in words Um, in, in, in response to that. And there is sort of a grief there. And that's a real crisis here Mm -hmm. is the human rights violations that are occurring and the number of deaths at the border and in detention. I think at the end of the day, when we see the complexity and the nuance just get completely lost in a lot of the conversations around this, and then the solution apparently is just like declare a national emergency, override Congress, and build a wall, we say, no No mames. mames. Thank you for listening to our No Mames Moment. So Alejandra, let's do our shout out. Who are we shouting out? So in this episode, we are going to shout out the YWCA Greater Austin here in Austin, Texas. Eva Escobedo, who we interviewed for this particular podcast episode, happens to be a supervisor there. And I also work there as a lead therapist. So the YWCA provides therapy for individuals and couples and families and groups. They have the mission of eliminating racism and empowering women. And they live that mission out through several programs, including our counseling department. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I love about working at the Y is just the broad mix of clients we get because we're sliding scale. Um, And so we can have sessions as low as $10 a session. And if people have been victims of crime Mm -hmm. or women veterans, they actually can get free services. So leave a link in the description of the way to access the YWCA. So shouting out the YWCA Greater Austin. Yeah, check it out. Can you talk a little bit about some of the different treatment modalities that that you use? So mostly I use somatic experiencing which allows for people, so first of all, to be resourced. So again, this idea that you first identify what feels okay. That's the piece that you start out with, and then you engage with a tiny portion of the trauma. So the um, metaphor that I use, it's like opening a shaken Coke bottle, right? You want to open any bit of air out and then close back in. And that's exactly how we work with trauma creating a sense of well-being or relative respite or rest in the session where we can explore a tiny bit, tiny nugget um, of the trauma and then resourcing again. And so what we're trying to do is to create a window of tolerance for the experience so it's not overwhelming. So yeah, so I can talk about when I woke up in the hospital or when somebody took care of me, or when I was able to cross the border, or whatever it was. So we always start out from when the experience was over, if it was over. And that's really another really important piece, because we do not want to do trauma work when somebody is still in danger, when they're still living in a situation of terror. 
Which brings up, you know, I think something that we were talking about earlier, how do you work with, with people navigating the immigration system? Like, how do you make that call? It's that, that, that is the trickiest piece. So you don't really want to tap a lot into the trauma. You're trying to just help them not be in constant overwhelm so that they can have, again, just moments of respite. And can you just tell us briefly why it's so important not to do trauma work with someone who maybe is currently in a relationship of domestic violence, for example? Because they are in danger. You don't want to shut that down. You want them hypervigilant. You want that, you want that fear response to be activated, right? Because right? that's saving their life. That is saving right? their lives. I mean, they're telling you, you know, I'm in terror. I can't sleep. You're right. Your body is telling you that something is going on. Your anxiety, your symptoms are saving your life. Do you want to listen to them? Mm-hmm. What are they telling you? So instead of trying to shut them down, which you never want to do anyway, um, it's what is your body telling you, right? What is the fact that you have insomnia telling you? What is the fact that, that you know that you're always pacing? What are your gastric sy- symptoms telling you? Yeah, I think that's another point of disconnection that's really common too, right? That we're not really connected with our bodies. Yes. And so even the idea of doing that can be new or also painful. or And so I think that that's what's really powerful about somatic yes. experiencing. And also, um, you know, I know that some people have to take it slower because it's overwhelming, and um, but it does, it's the essential part of how we function, right? And also the pieces around um, psychoeducation of why our bodies are doing what they're doing, I think can be so normalizing and validating because it does remove that piece of, am I going crazy because I'm feeling this way or thinking this way? I think that that is so valuable. I'm wondering if we can sort of shift gears a little bit. Maybe think about our own community, Austin. Being at the Y and being in other areas, what have you seen as specifically the mental health needs that are not being met currently for the Latinx community? So I think the first is recognizing truly um, that regardless of how they're coming to us or what they're coming to us with, to take into account their immigration story and to take that identity very much um, into what's happening. Because it is, it's, it's necessarily interwoven into that story. And would you say that that also kind of crosses um, generations? So like first mm-hmm. generation, mm-hmm. The Latinx, second generation? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So very often um, you find... Um, adolescents or young adults who do not speak the same language as their parents. Literally, they, there's a, now there's a language barrier where parents don't have access to their children, their children don't have access to their parents. And, and how d- devastating that is. Um, and identity, how do, you, how do you have a sense of belonging when your parents or your grandparents identify as something that may no longer be relevant or true for you. And so what does that do to your sense of connection and belonging, which are always at the crux of what we deal with, no matter what the, what people are coming in with. And just, I think, a, lot, a big piece is normalizing, because I think that there's a huge stigma around mental health, because, it's, because it has been stigmatized. Because um, the definitions that we have been given in our trainings are, so these are... Path- these are pathologies, and especially a lot of the a lot of the ways in which Latin um, communities function or Latin families function is more feminine in the sense that it's more communal, it's more relational, and those aspects have been pathologized chronically, institutionally, endemically um, in the mental health literature uh, with terms like you know codependent needy, clingy, um, all these horrible words. And, and so, rightfully so, they, they are fearful. And there is this idea of, yeah, so, so there's, 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 there, it, it means that there's something wrong with me. Yeah, I think the word needy is so interesting because it's like, yes, we all have needs. 
and we make them known and then that becomes pathologized. But one of the things I love that you do is I feel like you always ask when someone comes with any presenting concern, um, you ask what's the need behind that? What are they telling you their need is? And so Mm -hmm. I feel like we could get a lot further if we understood human interactions through that lens. So very often what we see in terms of uh, Latin communities um, seeking mental health services generally are family related. Of course, communal, family, yeah. Um, And very often it's a generational difference around obedience, around behavior, around all these things. And thank you, Anna, because very often what we don't see is that parents are operating from a place of fear. They're needing their children to be safe. And that's what they're fighting for. So they want their children to be obedient, to be compliant, to do these things, because that's the only recipe that they have for what they understand as safety, or as well, actually, of safety, actually. Right? So... You know, be careful, don't go out with a boy. Don't, I mean, all these all these things that we think is old-fashioned um, or, or outdated, that's what they know. And the intent is, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And that is heightened here. It's like many worse things can happen. Um, and there are these risks that we don't know how to avoid. And so it's, it's, it's also creating a bridge for families to understand that and to help the fearful parents name their fear instead of, oh, I, I want him to obey because it's respect. Eh, let, let's help identify what it, what it really is. What are you needing out of that? And I think like we go back to, to resources available to the community, I think a lot of them are are through the medical field, yes. and so that's just automatically pathologizing. Like yes. if people are coming in and they're talking about problems, and they they speak to a doctor, right? Well, doctor is going to treat it with medicine, right? Especially if it's not a place that's very well resourced, because you know I think either one of us here we can we have the resources to like look up somebody in private practice and yeah, go and speak sure. to somebody and not be pathologized. And and thank you, because very often people are sent um, in by a doctor for, for things like, so for example, I'm always fascinated that people are sent to the psychiatrist or and then to, to, to therapy, for example, after the death of someone. So if you're still crying three months later, then maybe there's a problem and you need Prozac. Well, no. <laughs> That's what grief is supposed to look like. Um, the problem is that there is no community to hold that. There is no ritual, right? So, okay, so the burial is over, what, I don't know, a week, two weeks later, and that's it. In Latin America, we have month, we have rosaries that are generally two weeks, and then you have a monthly mass, up to the year and then and then every year and so so there are all these rituals where people do come together where the loss is memorialized where there is support ongoing support it's acknowledged here literally okay the funeral is over we had a few glasses of scotch or whatever it is and then it's over and then what and then what are you left with Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not how we grieve. That's, again, because we are so separated from a sense of community and what is natural, meaning, and by natural I mean what aligns with who we are as human beings, as sentient beings, as beings that are deeply rooted in attachment. And so that is taken away, and of course we're going to break sure, but it's not because we're broken, it's because the system is broken. That reminds me, earlier you mentioned two of the basic things we need as human beings, and for the sake of our listeners, I'm wondering if you could just say what all four of them are. Sure. (laughs) So we need self-esteem, we need autonomy, we need connection, and we need safety. So I want to ask, what advice would you give to 
perhaps like a, a therapist who's been working in the field a long time, but is wanting to reach out more to the Latinx population? I would go back to how this podcast started with recognizing that being Latin is many, many different things and not to have an idea of what that means. And to please not make people choose by, by, by forcing them to amputate parts of themselves and to integrate, to welcome all parts of their stories. And um, for maybe new therapists or students who might be listening, um, who are Latinx or who may want to work with this population or both, um, do you have any advice for them? Be aware of how you are triggered. Be aware of your experience and don't shun that. Bring that and use that. Not necessarily by disclosing, but huh, reflect. What was that like for me? I wonder what that means. I wonder if it's like the, it, what that was like for others or if that impacts others. And, and bring that in. So we are again taught not to bring ourselves into um, the therapy room. And I think that that's a huge mistake because we can't not do that. In order to try to do that, we would become very distant. And that's terrible as therapists. We want to be present. So we need to acknowledge our own bias and name it in a way that is respectful. But that's going to show up. I mean, for, for at least I know for me and for many other therapists, I don't have a poker face. So I, can, I cannot pretend that I am not having a reaction. And, I, and, I, and I'm a sentient being. So, so this idea of being objective is crazy because we're not objects. We're subjective because we're subjects. And so it's not about moving that away. It's about bringing it in in a way that is meaningful and respectful and where you know what is yours and what is your client's. And you're not blending those. So you're not imposing. You can bring your own beliefs into the room without imposing them. And I think that that's what it's about. It's not about pretending that they don't exist and you're this neutral tabula rasa or something. Mm -hmm. Blank slate. <laughs> it, 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 it's yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask a follow-up question because I feel like this comes up a lot for students. Um, is the way in which we're taught about, again, the idea of boundaries, but with physical contact? Um, yeah, you were going to open that up. <laughs> I, knew I think that it's something that is so pervasively discussed, but when we talk especially about our own communities and the way in which physical contact is so important, um, I wondered if you could just share a little bit about your feelings, not that I know them or anything. I, re I really don't. So. You, I would love for you to share with Alejandra your feelings. <laughs> yes. So we have this... this uh, I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't remove that. <laughs> Um, so we have, at least counselors and social workers are often taught, I don't know how this, this is taught, but it's taught, that you're not supposed to touch your clients. It's not in the code of ethics. It is not, I promise, okay? Most of you believe it is, it is not, okay? Not as such, okay? So... You are warned about this, and, and I think that it is crazy-making. So, of course, you're not going to touch somebody in a way that is explosive, in a way that is unwelcome, for your own benefit. But the idea of not touching another human being is insane, especially when they're welcoming it, when they're asking for it, when they're initiating it, when they're needing it. And so... Ha! Huh. It is so important to me that it is actually, I think, the question that I ask prospect interns, that is the deal breaker. If somebody's not willing to hug back a client who wants to receive a hug, they have no place under my supervision. 
And now everyone knows how to get into the Y. And now everybody <laughs> knows how to get into the Y. There, I said you it. heard it here first. Shit, I didn't think of that. Now we need to remove that. It's okay, we can remove that. No, I'm kidding. Like. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but it is. And there's, there, there are many articles about um, the ethics of touch and how not touching when it is needed does harm. And therefore, that is unethical. So it is rethinking that. Um, and again, it's about we are taught boundaries in such a weird way <laughs> um, that goes so against our nature, our human nature, which requires contact. And, and, and we use all these metaphors, let's keep in touch. And contact is so important. And do we even think about what that means? It means with touch. We need touch. And, and anybody I know who's ever worked with, um, with anybody in the Latinx community, anybody who's worth their salt, touches. Like, it's just, how do you not? Like, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, even, like, hello. How do you say hello to somebody without touching it's, them? It's impossible. Yeah, right. it, you just look cold. Right, and I think that for a lot of students, that is the instinct. Mm -hmm. And then I have conversations with them where it, it becomes questioned because of our program, and and then they sort of have to relearn what they innately know. Can I ask you to talk about one more thing? Sure. That's that I think for new therapists um, is also important. So I think this idea of interventions and what to do when and what to bring into sessions, and I just think that you have a really great perspective on how for new therapists that becomes kind of such a priority. Um, and maybe what, what we can think about as just the fundamentals of therapy with anyone and, and what's important of that. The phrase that I hear the most from beginner therapists is, I just sat with my client and I didn't know what to do. And so I usually have a reaction with my non-poker face. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and what I guess the question I invite is, did you really sit with them, fully present? Did you convey in your being that you didn't need them to be anywhere else in any other way than exactly how they were? And if the answer is yes, then there's nothing just, there's nothing small about doing that because that is the hardest work. Pulling out a CBT worksheet or a narrative therapy worksheet or an anything beautiful worksheet, it doesn't matter, um, is easy, that's easy work. But that doesn't meet our needs. So if you remember, thank you, Anna, about asking about what the four needs are, right? Safety, does this place feel in any way safe? Do I know where the door is? Um, can I sit down? Do I know where, you know, what their policy is at this clinic around ice or around, I don't know, will they keep what I say confidential? So in that way, thinking about safety at the, at the, at the very basic, right? In this space with this person, do I have autonomy? Do I get to choose what I do? What I talk about, what I don't talk about, where I'm going to sit. Can I sit quietly? Can I cry for an hour? Can I not? Right? Do I have self-esteem? Can I be seen and recognized for my value as a human being? And, most importantly, connection. Are you with me? Are you willing to be my companion in this messy, stormy, difficult journey? Will you walk with me? And I think that it's that. And so I really encourage novice therapists to learn to be a good companion. And there's nothing just about that. Oh, that's beautiful. 
See, that's why I ask her these yeah. questions. Because I am. This, this is the second time. You're so this manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm an interviewer. <laughs> no, but I, I get to hear these things. Mm-hmm. And part of why we had you on is because I think that these are the kinds of things that should be shared and should be taught to people in our program. And so I just really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and we have one more question. Okay, yes. go for it. We ask this question to everyone. Okay. And it's one of my favorites. Okay, go ahead. What is your favorite herb or tea? I had never thought of that. Um, mm. So right now, and I don't know if these qualify as teas. Okay. Um, <laughs> herb, herb included. Okay. I don't, okay. Um, so I really like chai. I'm super commercial. I'm not. Like, it's okay. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> chai is great. And no judgment. <laughs> Doesn't chai mean tea? Yes. So okay. that's your favorite tea is tea. So whatever we call. It's a specific blend of herbs and spices. Okay, so the so those ones. So those ones. So the ones that are. So I guess it's cardamom. Mm-hmm. Um, There's some sort of black tea. I really don't know. It's some in- black tea. So, so something. So yeah, it, and it's sort of sweetie. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and I just discovered matcha, mm-hmm. and so that has become like an obsession, sort of. And I just discovered. So by accident, I bought the good quality matcha first. Yeah. But it came in like this tiny thing, and it was like thirty bucks. Yeah, I have I have some of that in my kitchen. <laughs> and and then I learned that there was like this lower quality, this cooking quality, and it doesn't taste as yeah, yeah. I I should have started the other way, but <laughs> um, a little goes a long way. Yeah, but it's really good. Yeah. So that um. Hmm. I like hibiscus, but to, but hibiscus to me is not tea, because it, because in Mexico it's agua de Jamaica, mm-hmm. and so it's That's so good. It's, but it's it, it's it's an herb, it's a flower. So I, I like Jamaica. Yeah, I, it's mm. cooling. Yeah, with yeah. mint, I mm-hmm. like that. And a lot of sugar. <laughs> yeah. I like it unsweetened. Really, I like, I like it, it unsweetened too. I like too. it. I can only. It's too tangy for me. For you, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. Um. Mm. Rose hip, jasmine, mm-hmm. mm. jasmine tea, yeah. Thank you so much You're for taking this time. Yeah, thanks for being on. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Latinx Mental Health Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LatinxMHPod, find us on Facebook and YouTube, and subscribe everywhere you listen to podcasts. Hasta la próxima!